Welcome to today's live broadcast titled Glycated Hemoglobin for Diagnosis and Monitoring of Diabetes, Current Practice. I'm Dave Wombrewster, a clinical chemist at Abbott Diagnostics, and I have the privilege of being the moderator for today's event. This webinar is held in conjunction with World Diabetes Day, 14th of November, 2015, to highlight the growing concern with the health threat posed by the global diabetes epidemic and to recognize the central role the clinical laboratory plays in diagnosis, diagnosing and monitoring diabetic patients. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals, and it is sponsored by Abbott Diagnostics. Before we start, there are a few instructions we want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can and we'll follow up if we don't have time to do so today. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll try to resolve any issues. This webinar has been approved for accent continuing education credits from the American Association for Clinical Chemistry. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your, your credits. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Gary John of the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital in the United Kingdom where he is the head of clinical biochemistry and immunology. Professor John is an expert in diabetes and glycated hemoglobin and served as the chair of the ICC's working group on standardization of hemoglobin A1C. He is currently the chair of the ICC's task force on implementation of HP A1C standardization. David, thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure to speak to everybody today about hemoglobin A1C, its biochemistry, and measurement. There's no doubt that the greatest advance in the study of diabetes was the introduction of insulin back in the early 1920s. But the great challenge for us in the laboratories is now how can we monitor the glycemic control in our patients with diabetes? Here we can see young Leonard Thompson before and after the first injection of insulin. The big move for us to the laboratories was the description by Raba in 1968, which brought to the notice of the medical fraternity what he then called an abnormal hemoglobin in the red cells of diabetics. But indeed, it was over a decade earlier that this fraction was first described by Kankel and Wallison, where they actually described a new fraction with the term hemoglobin A1. Over the many years since this first, this, uh, description, a number of uh, researchers have elucidated exactly what is happening in the biochemistry of this fraction. Let's look at this reaction sequence. All proteins will react with glucose as long as the glucose is in the open chain format. Almost all the proteins in the body, glucose will react with the lysine residue. Unlike the other proteins, hemoglobin is different where glucose will react to the n terminal valine rather than the lysine. So long as the glucose is in the open chain format, the protein will reversibly react with glucose, forming a double bond. This fraction is called a shift base. If here the glucose reforms the ring structure, no further reaction will take place. This reaction is fully reversible and takes part over a number of hours. The next stage of the reaction is an anodal rearrangement. This is an almost irreversible reaction, although these days we realize that the reaction is slightly reversible. <clears throat> 
Here the double bond moves from position number two to position number one, and this stabilizes the fraction. And once formed, ketoamine, hemoglobin A1C, is stable within the blood sample. This second reaction takes place over a number of days. So here we can see the full reaction, a complex reaction, not as straightforward as we see in textbooks. But once formed, the ketoamine is stable. This is a non-enzymatic reaction and follows the law of mass action. Here you see the kinetics of reaction. The first reaction forming the shift base, you can see is fully reversible. The forward and, rea and reverse reaction showing the same kinetics. Whereas the second reaction from shift base to ketoamine is almost irreversible. If you look at the reaction slightly further, glucose binds to proteins. And if the protein has got a, a short half-life, the amyloid product is formed by the shift base. This is the case for things like hemoglobin and albumin. But what if proteins have got a longer half-life? Well then, a further reaction takes place, forming advanced glycated end products. These are highly reactive substances and may actually form the basis of some of the complications related to diabetes. I will, not, I will not talk about these any further today because that would be a lecture in its own right. So what assumptions do we have to make if we got, are going to use hemoglobin A1C to monitor glycemia? We have to assume that hemoglobin is present at a constant concentration. Within an individual, this is probably true, but what about anemia? We have to assume the lifespan of the red blood cell is a constant. Again, within an individual, this is probably true, but may not be true between individuals. We have to assume the microenvironment is constant. Again, within an individual, this is probably true. If all these assumptions are true, then glucose is the only variable. And because this is a non-enzymatic reaction following the law of mass action, the, the, uh, the, form, the formation of hemoglobin A1C is a product of glucose concentration. But are these assumptions true? Well, it's interesting. We have little evidence or information what effect anemia has on the hemoglobin A1C. We know, or we think we know, that iron deficiency has an effect of increasing hemoglobin A1C. But in a recent systematic review, we have seen that there's very little evidence around this. Is it just iron deficiency or is iron deficiency and anemia? We don't know and this will need further looking at. What about the red lifespan? Well, of course, in, in medical school, you're always taught that red cells have a lifespan of 120 days. Well, that is true to a large extent Red cells are very, are very unlikely to survive much beyond 120 days. But there is a large variable in the lifespan of red cells, both within, in, within an individual and also mainly between individuals. You can see here some work done by uh, uh, Bob Cohen et al, where you can see that if you correct the lifespan of red cells in patients who have got the same glycemic level, we, we can correct hemoglobin A1C measured. Good evidence that red cell survival had a direct and important effect on the measured hemoglobin A1C. So what does this mean in real life? Well, you can have two patients, both with identical glycemic controls, identical mean glucose within their bodies but can produce hemoglobin A1C values that are at various ends of the population range for hemoglobin A1C. So patient one here has got identical glycemic control to patient two, but a very much different hemoglobin A1C. And this was shown quite nicely 
in the ADAG study published in Diabetes Care in 2008, where hemoglobin A1c relates directly to average glucose. But when we look at different patients, we can see that hemoglobin A1c of 8% relates to a range of glucose values, mean glucose values within different patients from around about 8.1 millimoles per liter to about 12.1 millimoles per liter, showing that there's a huge between individual variation in what the glycemic levels are with the same hemoglobin A1c. Also, you can see here some work done by Andrea Mosca and co-workers that the variability within individuals is quite small. Males, have, we can see here on these dots, individual subjects and the variation in hemoglobin A1c around the values. These, of course, are non-diabetic individuals. You can see that the male values actually vary quite small amount. But you can see here that in females, variation is much larger. We have no evidence to know why this is, but it is interesting. Also, what is being measured? We are always told that hemoglobin A1c represents the mean glycemia in patients for the last three months or so. Well, that is true, but by far the greatest influence on the result you obtain is within the month before the blood sample is collected. We see here, in a blood sample collected at the end of May, 52% of the influence of that result comes from the glycemia within May, 27% in April, and only about 5% from the glycemic control or the glycemic level three months or four months earlier. So yes, hemoglobin A1c does represent the glycemic control over the period of the red cell lifespan, but the major influence is in the preceding one month. What about methods for measuring hemoglobin A1c? Well, back in 1958, Alan et al. described a large column for separating off this newly found hemoglobin A1, but these columns are over a meter long and required one liter of blood to separate off enough hemoglobin A1. Well, for clinical work, that was never going to be an option. You can imagine if a botanist saying, only another half liter of blood, then we can measure hemoglobin A1C. Luckily these days, methods have been designed and described that allow us to measure hemoglobin A1C in a clinical situation. But there are a number of major method principles. The aligned charge separation. When hemoglobin binds to glucose at the end of the valine, it creates a very slight charge difference of the hemoglobin. So hemoglobin A1C can be separated from hemoglobin A0. There's also a structural difference. Obviously, glucose, when it binds hemoglobin, creates a slight difference in the structure of the molecule and also their chemical differences. There are a large number of HPLC methods that are described, and this is probably the longest uh, used uh, method group uh, in clinical medicine. Capillaryretrophesis, relatively new, used the same method principle of charge separation, but in a capillary rather than on a column. Affinity chromatography. This method recognizes the glucose moiety of the hemoglobin A1C and uses a boronic acid to bind the cis thiols of the glucose. The hemoglobin glucose binds the column and the non glycate hemoglobin washes off. You can then use a different buffer to wash off the glycate hemoglobin. This is interesting that the washing off of the hemoglobin is in reverse to that for ion exchange chromatography. Immunoassay, glucose bound to the hemoglobin creates a slightly different uh, structure and therefore an antibody can be raised against this slight difference. 
and there are a large number of amino acids now prescribed. The new method recently described is enzyme amino acid. This is where an enzyme is used to recognize the hemoglobin A1C. And also don't forget there are a large number of point of care systems available for measurement of the hemoglobin A1C. So why is standardization so important? Well, as I've already said, there are a large number of different method principles available for measuring hemoglobin A1C. Cardan exchange chromatography, capillary electrophoresis, affinity separation, immune acid, enzymatic. And also, around the world, there are over 100 different methods and platforms available, and over 20 international manufacturers. And when you consider national manufacturers, there are many, many more. So let's look back to the late 70s and early 80s. Things were not looking good. Not only were fashions poor, but let's look at hemoglobin A1C results. I was saying there was a large difference between the results obtained in different laboratories around the UK. And these CVs relate to a difference in measured hemoglobin A1C from about 4.4, 4.3 to about 9.5%. You can see this range in results um, are not acceptable for clinical use, especially when we as assume that a 1% change in hemoglobin A1C as measured in the DCCT and UK PDS studies shows that a 1% difference can lead to a 21% improvement in deaths related to diabetes, a 37% improvement in microvascular complications, a 14% improvement in myocardial and myocardial infarction. So methods with this level of difference are not of any clinical use. This lack of standardization and agreement in results uh, has led to a number of um, uh, mess, comp uh, countries developing their own standardization program. Probably the most notable of these is the NGSP system in America, but also um, the, Swede, the Swedish and the Japanese uh, had their own calibration systems. But there was a problem with this, um, with these uh, programs. Um, basically, none of them used a true reference method, and there was no primary reference material to anchor the results for stable, long-term reproducibility. The NGSP network was a good concept it used a central primary reference laboratory using a reference method, which was a reference method at the time when it was first described by Goldstein et al. back in the early uh, 1960s. But this was not a true reference method and was interfered with by a number of interference. This primary reference laboratory then standardized a number of secondary reference laboratories and the secondary reference laboratories were then used to standardize clinical methods used in our laboratories. It was a great concept, as I say, but there was no primary material to calibrate this HPLC, and also this HPLC, which was state-of-the-art back in 1986, was no longer recognized as a true reference method. But you can see the large improvements that were achieved by introduction of the NGSP uh, harmonization program. You can see here the range of results from the laboratories around the US in 1993 improved dramatically over the years to 2010, but the range of results achieved by laboratories 
is now so much better. But modern day practice of clinical biochemistry requires methods to be standardized to a methodological standard. And the requirements for methodological standardization are identification of the measure and the production of a reference measurement procedure, reference material, primary reference material, and laboratories that can be used as method to actually standardize uh, so laboratory methods. And also results to be traceable back from the patient sample to the reference measurement procedure. The IFCC recognized this shortcoming in standardization of hemoglobin A1C and formed a working group with the brief to actually produce a reference measurement procedure and reference material for hemoglobin A1C. This working group worked hard over a number of years, and here you can see us working hard in a local hostelry here in Norfolk. But seriously, this was a daunting task, but after several years of work, a reference measurement procedure was described and published, and reference material were produced which represented pure hemoglobin A0 and pure hemoglobin A1C, which could be used to calibrate the primary reference method. And based on this work, we have now got a traceable chain from a patient sample right back by an unbroken chain of events to the primary reference material, the pure hemoglobin A1C and the pure hemoglobin A0. The problem arose, of course, that the new reference measure procedure for hemoglobin A1C described by the IFCC was different in results to those obtained by the national societies as HbA1c standardization schemes. And that is because the IFCC reference procedure was specific for hemoglobin A1c, whereas the other methods had interferences in their method. So then the question was asked, what should we report hemoglobin A1c in? What units should we be using? Percent is not a recognized measurement unit. So the IFCC IUPAC committee looked at the molecule and decided that it should be reported in SI units. And the SI unit for hemoglobin A1C is millimole per mole, i.e. millimole of hemoglobin A1C per mole of hemoglobin A0 plus hemoglobin A1C. Of course, these results would be different to those currently reported in percent units. To try and identify what needed to be done and what changes need to be brought about, the IFCC met with the Clinical Diabetes Associations, the American Diabetes Association, the uh, European Association for Study of Diabetes, and the International Diabetes Federation to discuss how results should be measured and reported around the world. They came up with a consensus statement, and the two major parts of the consensus I've highlighted here, and those are the IFCC reference system for hemoglobin A1C is the only valid anchor for which methods around the world should be standardized against. And also, that hemoglobin A1C results should be reported worldwide in IFCC units or SI units millimole per mole, and derived NGSP units percent using the IFCC NGSP master equation, which I showed you earlier. But I will not talk much more about standardization. I will leave this to Dr. Weitkamp, who will be talking a little later on. So what are the challenges we now face for the new century? Well, the early diagnosis of type 2 diabetes is by far the greatest challenge we have. Around the world now, there are over 360 million people who have diabetes. But by 2030, 
this number will have risen dramatically to over 550 million people. And possibly the most worrying thing is that over half the patients with diabetes will go undiagnosed unless we can go out and look for these patients. And why is this dramatic increase in diabetes happening? Well, obesity is one of the main issues we face globally in clinical medicine these days. Here we can see the direct relationship between waist size and the thickness of your TV. So why is obesity happening? Well, it is the availability of cheap, high-calorie food. You can see here a big breakfast in a cafe. I would like to say in America, but this is a cafe 30 miles from a hospital here in the east of England. And all this food is available relatively cheaply, 15 pounds or $19. And if you need all that food, and I doubt where many of us could, it's free. So it's not surprising that obesity is a major issue and a major problem globally these days. So diagnosing diabetes, type 2 diabetes that is, then the move to type 2 diabetes is not an instantaneous event. It is a continuum ranging from normal glycemia to dysglycemia into diabetes. And currently where we diagnose diabetes is where we have an increase in the frequency of microvascular complications. So we are diagnosing diabetes at this point here. To improve the outcome, we try and move that diagnostic criteria down the line so we can diagnose these people earlier. By diagnosing these people earlier, we will limit the development of micro and macrovascular complications. And to this end, the WHO recommended in 2011 that HbA1c should be used for the diagnosis of diabetes. But they put forth some caveats that there needs to be stringent quality assurance systems in place before it is used. And also that the assays are standardized to the international reference values for this to happen, of course, methods need to be standardized to the IFCC reference system. As, as was stated in the consensus statement, it is the only anchor that is valid for standardization of hemoglobin A1C. So will this improve things? Well, it's debatable, because if we look at the 6.5% or 48 millimoles per mole cutoff for diagnosis of diabetes, Patients already have significant macrovascular complications, high number of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and total mortality has increased already by that time. So I think over time we will need to actually look at the value of the cutoff. So our methods that we use in the laboratory, are they accurate enough? Well, I think of it this way. We now have the IFCC reference measure procedure for standardization. I can look at this as an atomic clock, accurate to one second in 30 million years. But in our laboratories, we have our routine methods. And no matter how good those methods are, they can, the, they are, the results we produce are only as good as the method we use. So we can set our accuracy, but the quality of the methods we use in the laboratories is still ultimately the most important thing. And accuracy is important. If you look at this graph here, this shows hemoglobin A1C results in an undiagnosed group of Americans uh, in the US census population. These people are not known to be diabetic. But if you look here, a 0.1% or one millimole per mole difference in the results result in about one million people being wrongly diagnosed. In real life, what does this mean? Well, this is a recent return from the CAP survey, where we look at hemoglobin A1C results returned around America. This is out here 
group resulted from this method group 45 millimoles per mole, 6.28%, ranging up to 52 millimoles per mole, 6.88%. And this is interesting because the mean value was 6.5% or 48 millimoles per mole, the cut point for diagnosis. There is a 7 millimole per mole difference here, 0.7%. How many people will be wrongly diagnosed across the US with this range of results? Also, within method groups themselves, we find results that, are, uh, that show good accuracy, but the variability around their accuracy is far too great. We also find results that are both inaccurate and imprecise. We must work to actually stop using these methods. So to finish, I just want to point out that even though glucose and hemoglobin A1c relate to each other, they do not equal each other. In the general population, glucose concentration does not equal hemoglobin A1c. And diagnosis of glucose does not equal diagnosis of hemoglobin A1c. They are different and have to be treated differently. Let's look at a particular patient. Here we get a 50-year-old male with a history of heart disease. He had a fasting glucose dump because the general practitioner looking after this patient thought he may actually have diabetes. The fasting glucose was 6.3 millimoles per liter, 113 milligrams per deciliter. And my laboratory reported this as impaired fasting glycemia. The GP was still concerned, so we repeated the sample a few months later. On the 5th of December 2012, the fasting glucose was 6.6 .6 millimoles per litre, 119 milligrams per deciliter, and its hemoglobin A1C was 47 millimoles per mole, not quite reaching the 6.5% cut off for diabetes. Again, my laboratory reported this as impaired fasting glycemia. The GP was unsatisfied and repeated it again. This shows how good my glucose method is. 6.5 millimoles per litre, 117 milligrams per deciliter. Again, impaired fasting glycemia. So the GP decided to do a glucose tolerance test in this patient. The fasting glucose was 6.9 millimoles per litre. Again, impaired fasting glycemia. But the two hour value was 17.9 millimoles per litre. 322 milligrams per deciliter. A definite diagnostic criteria for diabetes. But is this patient diabetic or not? That is the question. The following month, following year, hemoglobin A1C cuts the 6.5% cut level for diabetes. This goes to show that the diagnostic criteria for hemoglobin A1C and for, and for glucose diagnose different individuals. I hope I've shown you, even though with a, with a technical glitch in the middle, that the measurement of hemoglobin A1C is not so straightforward, but methods we use are improving all the time, and soon our ability to diagnose diabetes earlier in our patients will be of value. Thank you. Thank you, Professor John. Our second speaker is Dr. Cass Wykamp, director of the MCA laboratory at the Queen Beatrix Hospital in the Netherlands. Dr. Wykamp is a globally recognized authority on hemoglobin A1C standardization and certification. He is the network coordinator of the ICC's hemoglobin A1C reference method system and responsible for the worldwide standardization of hemoglobin A1C assay. Did that? Thank you, David, for introducing me. I'm going to talk today about quality targets for HbA1c with a focus on diagnostic use. What we don't realize often in the laboratory that we are the cornerstone for the treatment and for diagnosis of diabetes. Um, and in combination with the fact 
that diabetes is a chronic disease with the higher prevalence, we can imagine that lab tests are extremely important. So HbA1c requires the highest quality. So HbA1c requires the highest quality. So the highest quality of HbA1c. It starts with standardization. And then you can require what and why standardization. When you standardize, you get equal results, irrespective whether in any laboratory, anywhere in the world, or manufacturer, you have equal results. Once you have achieved that, you have uniform interpretation. The same clinical guidelines, the same clinical decision limits, the same literature. And that's very convenient. The benefits is reliability. Patient safety comes first, but as Dr. Graham Beasnall, past president of the IFCC, stated, there are many more points why we should standardize. For example, public confidence, patient safety, clinical governance. Then comes the question, how to standardize? Well, for HbA1c, as Gary and John already pointed out, there are many method principles, HPLC, affinity chromatography, etc. And for each method principle, there are many, many manufacturers. And that implies that you get many different results when you don't standardize. And this, there was awareness already 20, 30 years ago, and there were national initiatives to standardize. In the US, best known, the NGSP, but also in Japan and Scandinavia. Unfortunately, when you compare the national reference systems, it appears that the analytical anchor is arbitrarily chosen. They are not specific, and therefore you get different numbers. And that causes a lot of confusion. And then the IFCC came in and said, this is unacceptable. We want someone to develop a scientifically sound reference method as the anchor to achieve worldwide harmonization of HbA1c. And that's what happened. I won't go through the whole thing, but the concept of the traceability of the traceability chain was adopted. It starts with the definition of the analyte, then you have a primary reference measurement procedure with which you assign values to the primary calibrator, and that primary calibrator is used to calibrate the secondary reference measurement procedure, etc. And at the bottom of the traceability chain, you have the routine laboratory, your laboratory, and a patient sample. This has become an approved reference method already 13 years ago, so it was in place. To warrant that there is access throughout the world, it was necessary that the IFCC reference method was operated all over the world. And by now we have a network of laboratories doing this, as you can see in Europe, in the Americas, and in Asia. Quite recently, a third Chinese laboratory joined the uh, network, and there is still one candidate. And it's quite something when a laboratory passes the criteria of the IFCC network, time to celebrate, and as network we have a special batch of champagne which we hand out to the laboratory that gained the status of an approved laboratory. Here, the Shanghai Laboratory, three years ago. Also, to maintain the quality of the network laboratories, we have a technical meeting once a year. Here you see a photo of the group taken this year at Euromed Lab in Paris. Once the IFCC reference method was in place, we thought that the work was done. But it wasn't true, definitely not. For there was a debate on HbA1c numbers, and 
everything, every time when there is a change, there are three kinds of people, purists, conservatives, and strategists. And that was also the case with the HBA1C. The purists, I'm one of them, they say, well, we have this IFCC reference system now, also use the units and patient reports. Do it. But the conservatives have an opposite uh, view. They say, well, keep the old DCCT numbers. Physicians are used to it. Patients are used to it. Never change a winning team. And that's the prevalent view in the US. And then there are strategists, in this case the IFCC and the uh, important international diabetes organizations. They concluded there must come a consensus statement. And that is what happened. Essential, as Gary John already pointed out, is that the IFCC reference method is the analytical anchor for HbA1c, but HbA1c should be reported in patient reports in IFCC and NGSP units. So that's the world today. International, we have distances in kilometers, temperature in degrees Celsius, and HbA1c in millimole per mole. And in the US, you have miles, Fahrenheit, and percentage HbA1c. We simply have to live with it. Fortunately, as IFCC network coordinator, I have a good relation with Randy Little, the NGSP network coordinator, and twice a year we exchange samples between both networks to be sure that the master equation, this is the equation to convert from NGSP to IFCC and vice versa, is still correct. And at the bottom, you see this equation. Also, dual certification, IFCC and NGSP. So, we have achieved full standardization in the world for HbA1c. And indeed, we have universal interpretation guidelines. Therapy goal below 53 millimole per mole, etc. The total system is in place now. The IFCC reference method at the bottom is used to assign values to the IFCC calibrators, and those calibrators are supplied to all manufacturers of HbA1c kits. And those manufacturers use the calibrators to assign values to the kit calibrators you use in your laboratory. Also, you participate in a proficiency test program or an external quality assessment program. And the samples you get from your EQAPT organizers have target values assigned with the IFCC reference method. And when there is a perfect match, you will see you have a good score in your PT uh, scheme, and then you can say that is a perfect match. And then we have achieved what we want, uniform clinical guidelines, reliable results. Patients and diabetologists can rely on what we are doing in the laboratory. And the efforts of the standardization people, of the manufacturers, of you in the laboratory, resulted in a dramatic improvement of the quality. In my EQA program, I have seen that 20 years ago, the interlaboratory CV, so the between laboratory CV was 33%, and last year it dropped to 3%, a dramatic improvement of quality. And because quality of HbA1c improved that much, there's also a change in paradigm. HbA1c is not only used anymore for monitoring, but also for the diagnosis of diabetes. And that's quite something. HbA1c, gold standard for HbA1c. Where previously it was the fasting plasma glucose or the glucose tolerance test. Not everybody agrees. There is discussion about it. And that is explained by the small differences in the range of HbA1c. When you look at the graph, you see that with an HbA1c below 40, you have a low risk 
to have or to develop diabetes. And only at slightly higher values, at 47 millimol per mole or higher, you have diabetes. And there is a small range from 40 to 47 where there is an increasing risk for diabetes. So you can imagine a small error has a high impact on interpretation. And the error in your laboratory can derive from bias due to wrong calibration or from imprecision when the reproducibility is not very good in your laboratory. Let's have a closer look. The impact of bias on interpretation. Say you have a sample with a true value of 44 millimol per mole and you have no bias in your laboratory. You find exactly the correct value and the interpretation is correct, increasing risk. But when you have a positive bias of 4 millimol per mole, you will report a value of 48 millimol per mole and the physician will conclude this patient has diabetes. On the opposite, when you have a negative bias of 4 millimole, you will report a value of 40 millimole per mole. That implies that the physician will conclude low risk for this patient. So quite wrong conclusions from wrong numbers. And then the impact of imprecision on interpretation. Again, you have a, the same sample with a true value of 40 millimole per mole. When you assay this sample, say, 20 times in your laboratory, and you have a CV of 1%, each of these assay results will be within a very narrow range, all allowing the same conclusion, increasing risk of diabetes. When the CV of your assay is 2%, still quite acceptable, when it goes up to 4%, you can expect values in the same sample that are either in the diabetic or in the low risk range. And that's not very good for interpretation. So, this new application of HbA1c, the use for diagnosis, led to new awareness of quality. And the ISCC task force on HbA1c has an important mission statement and that is to develop a model for quality criteria. And that's what we have done. And we follow the concept of sigma metrics. There are two things that you should define when you apply this model. First, an allowable error. What do you allow? What is the maximum error you allow in your laboratory? At this task force, we set a default value of 5 millimole per mole. Or you say, I want to be sure that the result I report from my laboratory is not different more than 5 millimole per mole from the true value. And the second thing that is defined, that's the risk of not meeting the criterion. And we said, as IFCC task force, it is acceptable that 1 out of 20 results doesn't meet the defined criterion. I want to stress that these are default settings. We are an international organization and can't uh, say to all organizations at the national level you can do it. It's up to local authorities to adopt these default settings or to set more or less stringent criteria. But the model can be used irrespective of the criteria. An explanation, not in mathematics, but in a graph, you make a plot of the imprecision and the bias, the bias on the y-axis in concentration units. So you can plot the bias of 1, 2, 3, 4 millimole. And on the x-axis, the imprecision in CV units from 1 to 5%. And the line is from 5 millimole per mole bias to 5% imprecision. So creating a triangle. When dots are within the triangle, that's your performance. So that means you are within the criteria of the IFCC. When you have a point, a dot, outside the triangle, um, it means that you are without, uh, outside the criteria. Two examples to demonstrate uh, the uh, 
extremes where you can just pass. Here you see an example of a laboratory uh, represented by the heart. This laboratory has a CV that is excellent, near 0%, with a bias of 4 millimole per mole. That's just good enough to pass. And here you see the other example. Hardly any bias, but a high CV. And that is also just good enough to pass the criteria. Now we come to the application of the model. You can apply the model in the individual laboratory. You can do it in your laboratory. You can also apply it at a country level or at a manufacturer level. And I will show several examples. Let's start with the country level. Say Barack Obama wants to know and asks, when I have my HbA1c assayed in any laboratory anywhere in the US, can I expect that the IFCC criterion is met? And you can take that information from the CAP survey. About 3,000 laboratories participate in it, and you can plot the bias, the mean of all those laboratories in the US, and you can also plot the between laboratory CV in the US of all those 3,000 laboratories. And then you will see, this is the CAP survey of 2014, that there was a mean bias of all laboratories of about 1 millimole per mole, and the between laboratory CV was 4% in, uh, in NGSP and 6% in IFCC units. So clearly outside the IFCC criteria. We can also have a look at the manufacturer level. Obama is not satisfied. He says, OK, so in general, we don't meet the criteria. Why is that? Is there any relation with the methods or with the manufacturers? And also, those data you can take from the CAP data. That's done in this figure. What I have done is a plot of groups of users that are using the same method of a manufacturer. Each dot represents a group of, manu group of laboratories using the same method. For example, they are BioRed users, or they are Tozo users, uh, or they are uh, Abbott users, etc. Dots represent laboratory instrumentation. Squares represent point of care instruments. Green are immunological methods, red are ion exchange methods, yellow is affinity chromatography, and blue is the capillary electrophoresis. And you see quite a difference in performance between the methods. About half of them are within the triangle, implicating that all laboratories using those methods are successful in uh, performing well. The other half of the methods is outside the criterion. For example, when you look at the red dots of the U and W, those are typically methods well calibrated, uh, well uh, reproducible, with an imprecision of approximately 2%, but quite a high bias. And that high bias causes that this group of laboratories is outside the criteria. When you go to dot A, green, right below, the opposite. Hardly any bias, but the interlabor between laboratory CV is quite high. And then the poorest performance is for the methods S, R, T, and O. They have all. They have and a high bias and a poor imprecision. And they are far outside. Now Obama wants to know what about innovative efforts of manufacturers? Any progress over time? And the answer is yes. This is a typical example. This is a CAP survey one cycle later. And you see that one of the manufacturers of SRT started with a new method, the enzymatic method. And that performance is doing very well in the CAP survey. It's the purple dot. So, 
Improvement is possible, and when it happens at a large scale with all manufacturers, I'm quite sure that the performance, overall performance, will come within the criteria. When you want to read more about this model, please go to the clinical chemistry of May last year. To summarize, the IFCC reference system is in place and used. Second, quality of HbA1c assays improved dramatically, and that led to a paradigm change. HbA1c is now also used for diagnosis. That led to rethinking of quality, and the task force made constructed a model for quality targets that can be applied in the individual laboratory, at the country level, and at the manufacturer level. And once quality targets are met, we do what we have to do. We have achieved optimum quality, and that's optimum for use for diagnosis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor John and Dr. Weikamp for your presentations. We're now ready for the Q&A session. As a quick reminder, questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And we do have several questions already. Uh, the first one is, what is the advantage of a standard to a true reference material for patient care if you can convert percent to millimoles per mole? And I think probably both of our speakers will want to, to answer that question. Well, Kaz? Well, when I start, when I answer, the advantage of changing from the NGSP or any other unit used in the world, for example, in uh, Japan or in Sweden, or a manufacturer value, is that it's standardized and it's same all over the world. It's so convenient when there would be only one unit. So that's the advantage for patients, that uh, there's only one unit in use. Gary? I, I think it shouldn't be confused. Uh, the standardization of the method against the unit used to report the, method, the, the value in. Standardization is vital to the same number or at least the same result being produced in different laboratories. The unit was decided to change from uh, percent units to millimoles per mole by a different committee to the standardization committee. And that is because percent is not a recognized unit of measurement. And in a metrological um, system, you have to use recognized units of measurement. And the SR unit where it compares mole to mole was the one that was agreed upon. But don't get confused. The standardization is different to the terminology used to report the result. Thank you both. Uh, next question, is the variability of a hemoglobin A1C in children greater than in adults? There, there, there's no biological reason that the number will differ apart from the glucose control. Glucose control in uh, children is far poorer than it is in adults for obvious reasons. So the higher the glucose, the higher the hemoglobin A1C. There is evidence that as patients get older, HbA1C values are higher for the same level of glycemia. The reason for this is relatively unknown but that is in the older individuals. I think clinically we know that the glycemic control in, in children is slightly poorer than those in adults. Dr. Weichamp, did you want to, to respond as well? I think uh, Gary gave a very good answer. I have nothing to add to that. Thank you, Gary. Okay, then we'll go on to the next question. Uh, what, when it's uh, explained that glucose is not equal to hemoglobin A1C, does that mean that a person can have very high values of glucose but normal A1C values? 
glucose is, is non light in, in its own right. Hemoglobin A1C is a product of a reaction. And as I hopefully try to point out, that the value of hemoglobin A1C in an individual is reliant on a number of factors, which we hope and assume may be constant, but as we now know, they're not totally. So in, in an individual, the same level of glycemia in patients who have got a variability in red cell survival or the microenvironment, the hemoglobin A1C result may be different. It is difficult to imagine a very high glucose resulting in a normal hemoglobin A1C. They do relate to each other, but what I was trying to say is that they're not the same. And that when you diagnose a patient with glucose, you're potentially diagnosing a different cohort of individuals to that you may diagnose hemoglobin A1C. There is no evidence to actually say one is better than the other. They are different. I agree with Gary that there is a different information from HbA1c and glucose. Um, I think the best information in case of doubt is when you do both and repeat it from time to time in case you doubt about it. There will be quite a number of patients, especially in elderly people of around 60 years, that are borderline, do they develop or don't they develop HbA1c? And then it gives good information. And we should also keep in mind that glucose just gives a picture of today, and that can be quite different from tomorrow, where HbA1c gives an integrated picture of a couple of months. So in my opinion, um, there is different uh, information from it, but best patient care is when you do both. Thank you. Now we have a very practical clinical question. Is it recommended that pre-diabetic individuals, say with a, an A1C percent value of about 5.6, be started on treatment? I think it's important to actually recognize that they are not diabetic. I think that's the first thing to say, that they have not fulfilled the criteria for being uh, identified and labeled as diabetic. But yes, uh, I think most physicians um, around the world now would recognize this pre-diabetes um, um, condition and would institute a degree of lifestyle change. So I, I, think, it, I think when we're looking here, we're looking to lifestyle change rather than treatment per se. But yes, it is important that these patients are identified and changes are started to improve their lifestyle. I think in HbA1c exceeding 5.6% should ring bells that things are not quite good as they should be. And then you start at the lowest level, change lifestyle, as Gary says, lose weight, um, exercise more. And if that doesn't work and HbA1c remains high, you may think of starting therapy. And what exactly the thresholds should be, maybe somewhere between 6 and 6.5% between 44 and 48 millimoles per mole. Can also be different from person to person, also depending on age. I think when a person is 90 years old, you can be less critical than when a person is uh, 42 or something. I, I think Kaj is right there. I think the important thing there is that the present cut of a 6.5 uh, the patients already have significant macrovascular disease by that point. I think 6.5 or 48 millimoles per mole will be a number that will have to be revisited in the next few years and possibly corrected to provide a better diagnostic criteria. The next question is perhaps potentially contentious, and it is, should A1C values be reported as millimoles per mole, the SI units? or should they be reported as percent A1C, the NGSP units? Well, my, my preference is that we use SI units, like we use uh, kilometers, like we use degrees Celsius. I'm also in favor of using millimoles per mole, 
But for me as European, it's quite difficult to tell the Americans that they should change to millimole per mole or that they'd leave miles, etc. So my preference is millimoles per mole, but in daily practice, I have to simply have to live with two units. But my preference, clearly millimoles per mole, for it represents the true HbA1c. And there is also a linear relationship with glucose. When glucose is zero, HbA1c in IFCC units is also zero. But when glucose is zero, HbA1c in uh, NGSP units is 2.1%. And that 2.1% is non-HbA1c reported as HbA1c. Gary? I, I, I think uh, sli slightly different to, uh, to cars as a European. Uh, as, a, as a British European, I still drive my car around in miles. But I also but I do agree with cars that millimoles per mole is the correct unit to report in purely because in metrological terms, percent is not a recognized unit of measurement. Percent is something which um, uh, was used because it describes what we, what we uh, measured and presented it out uh, A1C against, uh, against total like, uh, hemoglobin. But in true terms, we should report them in molar terms and millimoles per mole is the correct way of actually reporting it. But I agree with Kaz, we have to be pragmatic here. And if people feel comfortable with percent units, then it, you know, we, we will not want to dictate what people are to report in. But in millimoles per mole term, there is a direct linear relationship with glucose down through zero. Thanks for those uh, two very practical responses. We only have time for one more question. Other questions can be answered via email. Final question is, are there point of care testing devices available for A1C and how accurate and reliable are they in comparison to the central lab devices that I think you've primarily been speaking about today? Uh, there are in point of care devices available. And as I have seen, and you could see in my presentation, some of them uh, perform quite well. But there are also reports of systems that do not report well. And even when in CAP survey you see that the performance of point of care is quite good, you should keep in mind that it can make quite a difference whether such a point of care instrument is operated by a laboratory staff, as will be in the laboratories that participate in the CAP survey, or when it's operated in a doctor's office where people are less experienced with laboratory work and where it can be less good. Gary? Yes, I, I think there, were very, there are a number of devices about, as Kaz said, um, and I think uh, there were two very good publications by Una Lentes in clinical chemistry over the last couple of years, which actually shows that some devices are extremely good, and in many cases are actually as good as laboratory methods, whereas other methods are actually quite poor and should be avoided totally. So I, I would advise use it, reading uh, Dr. Linder's paper in clinical chemistry, uh, two papers, uh, and published over the last two to three years. That concludes our Q&A session, and thank you again to both of our speakers, Professor John and Dr. Wykamp, as well as our sponsor, Epidiagnostics, Diagnostics, for making this webinar possible. Just as a reminder, you can get free continuing education credits by clicking on the link at the bottom of your screen. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through the 19th of May, 2016. You will receive an email alerting you when it's available on-demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward this announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thanks again for logging on and participating in today's webcast. See you next time.